Hey everybody, Optimus Tom here with another Pioneer Deck Tech. This time around, it's going to be Enigmatic Fires, which took Jesus Buenrostro to a top 32 finish at the most recent DreamHack Atlanta Regional Championships. Now, I'm excited for Enigmatic Fires because this was my breakout deck of the tournament. I thought it was going to have a stellar performance, even if it wasn't going to have the most representation at the event and it delivered. Out of all the decks that had enough to be considered statistically significant, Enigmatic Fires was the deck list that had the highest win rate overall from the pilots of the tournament and took multiple people into the top 32, not just Jesus. This one, however, was a deck that's, that I picked up since it was the highest placing one, and I wanted to just quickly go over Enigmatic Fires, give some people a refresher, or for people who are more new to the Pioneer format, let you know what the deck is trying to do, and why it has this enigmatic name. Uh, mostly it's going to be centering around the fact that this deck can be run as a uh, deck with a companion, Karuga the Macro Sage, which has its own interactions with the deck, despite being not just being a dinosaur hippo and a big threat in and of itself, but you're going to wind up finding that this deck with converted meta cost 3 or higher cards in it, this will be a very powerful draw card engine which will pair with other parts of the deck, namely Fire as an invention, the Fire is part of the deck, to provide unsurmountable advantages that your deck will be able to produce for you. Some of these decks do not run Karuga in the main deck. They may run Yorian as a uh, companion instead to give you access to more things to find, and then run Karuga in the deck itself, not as the companion, so that they still have this very oppressive draw engine synergy in the deck. However, a lot of the more successful decks will be this Karuga the Macro Sage companion. But this pairs extremely well with the two namesake cards of the deck. Enigmatic Incarnation, which will basically say at the beginning of your end step, you sacrifice another enchantment. If you do, you search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost equal to one plus the sacrifice enchantment's converted mana cost ability, and you just put it onto the battlefield. This is very reminiscent of cards like Birthing Pod in Modern, where you continue to go up the proverbial food chain in your deck, finding bigger and bigger threats off of smaller or increasing cost enchantments as you play them from your deck. This pairs extremely well with Fires of Invention, which says that you can only cast spells during your turn, and you can't cast more than two spells per turn. However, you can just cast spells for free, as long as you have the lands that could potentially do it. So you got a four converted mana cost card like Fires on turn four, you can then play another four converted mana cost card like Enigmatic Incarnation. And then you can sacrifice your Fires of Invention to find a five drop on turn four. Very, very powerful interaction. However, you're mostly going to be keeping the fires around for a little bit, so you can continue to deploy multiple things, find things off your enigmatic incarnations, and kind of go up from there. This, of course, has a very powerful enchantment package inside of it, because you need enough enchantments to sacrifice the enigmatic incarnation to go up your food chain. So, of course, you have four copies of Fable the Mirror Breaker, which is providing you advantages in multiple ways, because Fable is a very powerful card in the format. You have Leyline Binding, because you are a multicolored deck. You're going to be having a mana base full of Triomes and Shocklands, so Leyline Binding on the cheap means that you can curve Leyline Binding early into enigmatic incarnation to find a 7-drop as soon as turn three if you have the mana ramp to do so very very powerful you also get to run main deck temporary lockdown this is a house against boros convoke decks this is a house against the abs Malia combo decks. This is pretty powerful removal, which if you remove a bunch of tokens, you don't even care if you sacrifice it to go up your food chain anymore because they're all gone regardless. You just find yourself a four drop. Uh, Touch of the Spirit Realm, helping you blink things. This is why Yorian is sometimes run in these decks as well. A lot of these cards have ECB effects or enters the battlefield effects so that you're going to be getting advantages generated immediately. Blinking them with Touch of the Spirit Realm, just having them come back to the next end step is another powerful way to get multiple versions of those effects. However, you could also just use it as a piece to just get rid of something from your opponent's side of the battlefield, or you could hard cast it, use it on your own thing, and then get rid of it with animatic incarnation, get your ETB effect again, and find an additional four drop. And then of course, the persistent or the virtue cycle coming out from uh, Wiles of Eldraine. Virtue of Persistence is a very powerful removal spell because it gives minus three, minus three till end of turn. You gain two life early on, and then later on you can sac you can play it from the adventure part. However, you could also just curve a leyline binding into a virtue of persistence as early as turn three, yet again, and just start taking things from everybody's graveyard as you're killing it or your own things are being sacrificed away. Um, your creature package is basically it's kind of toolboxy. I, it's kind of just very powerful effects in general. 
you of course have your big thing you're going to be getting at seven mana cost as you work your way up your food chain is atroxa grand unifier so that early leyline binding into a turn three enigmatic incarnation that then becomes a atroxa is a very hard thing to come back from even for the strongest decks in pioneer so yeah this is kind of another version of an atroxa surprise deck which then looks at the top 10 cards in your library you can put another enchantment to enigmatic incarnation from uh, into you can put an additional threat in there if you have a fires of invention all of a sudden now you can just have those creatures in your hand and play them because you're playing lands every single turn because you're finding them off of these atroxa triggers very very powerful card to come across um, you also have a bunch of kind of hate pieces like Elishnorn, Mother of Machines, completely shutting down enters the battlefield effects, and then of course uh, doubling yours. So enters the battlefield effects like uh, Atroxa here. So you want to look at the top 20 uh, and find as many cards as possible. Very powerful thing here. It also works extremely well with Titan of Industry, which is another seven drop you're going to be trying to find. So you get enters the battlefield and get all of its effects, or you can get your effects multiple times. This is also a great piece against hate pieces, against ley line bindings. You can protect your own creatures. So if you wind up finding an Atroxa and then getting a Titan of Industry and putting a shield counter on your Atroxa so it's protected from a removal spell or protecting a shield through the apocalypse so that you could just sit there and gain advantage while your opponent struggles to try to deal with your board. There's just so many powerful haymakers that go into this deck and it's all powered by this enigmatic fires engine. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, your land base is going to be extremely multicolor. You basically have all five colors represented here from a slew of triomes and shock lands. And because this deck is a Karuga deck, you're probably not playing anything besides the stomp side of Bonecrusher Giant or the lock lane scorn side of Virtue of Persistence early on. So that means for the first two turns, you don't really care if your lands enter the battlefield tapped or anything like that. So there you go. 27 enters the battlefield tapped or potential shock lands trying to power your mana base out just so you can get domain to get those early ley line bindings down. Uh, your sideboard also takes advantage of the fact that you're able to kind of play every color under the sun. So you have four ley line bindings, makes you strong against graveyard decks, four mystical disputes, so you can pivot into surprise, counterspelling some blue spells early on against blue white control because it still fits the Karuga, the macro sage requirement by only being a three mana spell. However, it could cost one if it's in a counterspell war. Very powerful effect. And you also get things like Unmoored Ego, which just chooses a card name. It doesn't say non land, it doesn't say non creature, it doesn't give you limitations so you can just take nykthoses out of mono green decks if you want to you can take away opposing fires or opposing enigmatic incarnations you could just get phoenix out of the phoenix deck if you really want to and you don't even have to worry about having a turn zero ley line on the void so this deck has a huge package of things and a huge presence on the board the reason why i like this deck was because it is very strong against is it phoenix and rakdos midrange both of which were two of the top three decks that we saw at the rc and it does have a lot of game against the Amalia combo deck, which is another of the top three popular decks there. Because you're able to run temporary lockdown main deck, you completely shut down Amalia's game plan. Uh, part of the reason why this deck maybe did not squeak into the top eight is because the Azorius control matchup is a little bit difficult, especially if they're packing early counter spells like some of the decks were here. Uh, make disappears, uh, Jawari disruption even, because all of your things are three converted mana cost or higher, you're going to be slow to the board and control decks love playing a slow board state. So those are going to be some difficult matchups for you. Overall though, the Enigmatic Fires deck I think is a very powerful metagame choice at this moment. And because all of the decks that are tempo style decks that get underneath it, like Spirits and Mono White Humans are being kept down by the other mid-range decks that this deck is good against right now, I feel like this deck is going to be here to stay and ready to play for quite a while. Of course, if you like all this pioneer content from me, you can follow me on YouTube and TikTok at OptimusTomTV. You can also find all of my content posted across Reddit by following user at OptimusTom. Thanks for watching.